Good evening again, everyone. My name is Shiri Sandler. Um, I'm grateful for Voices of Hope inviting me here this evening to have a conversation with Sarah Wildman about her book, Paper Love. Um, I am the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. Uh, many of you here in town knew my grandmother, Gisela Adamski. Uh, and professionally, I am the managing director of an organization in Rwanda called the Agahozo Shalom Youth Village, which is a post-genocide reconstruction organization that works in the model of the Israeli youth villages with orphaned and vulnerable youth. I'm privileged to be here tonight and really looking forward to this discussion. So tonight we're going to spend about 45 minutes talking with Sarah and then we will have 15 minutes for q and I'll encourage you to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to put in questions for submission to Sarah. Um, as I said, I'm grateful to be here tonight to have this opportunity to talk with Sarah. If you've read her book, Paper Love, which I imagine many of you have, uh, you also, yes, there I see it. I see it on the screen. I'm sure everyone is excited to hear from her tonight. Sarah Wildman is an accomplished journalist and writer. Currently, she is an op-ed page editor at the New York Times and is working with a grant from the Jewish Writers Initiative to turn Paper Love into a film which I'm sure there are going to be Q&A questions about. Sarah is the co-creator, producer, and host of Foreign Policy's First Person Podcast. The recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, Sarah has lived in and reported from Paris, Vienna, Madrid, Washington, Jerusalem, and Berlin. And her stories appear in publications including The New York Times, Newsweek, The Washington Post, Slate, and the New Republic, to name only a few. Following the passing of her grandparents, Sarah found a cache of letters written to her grandfather, which opened a path into the destroyed world that was her family's pre-war Vienna. With the help of these letters, Sarah pieces together the story of Valerie Schestel, Lali, the love her grandfather left behind when he escaped Nazi Austria. Sarah, thank you so much for being here this evening and taking the opportunity to talk to us about paper love. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So Sarah, Paper Love starts with the loss of a person you loved, your grandfather, a man you knew as joyful, loving, and heroic. How did you get from that place of grief to a place of inquiry? Can you tell us the story of what prompted you to take on the enormous task of finding Bali? So I think there are multiple start points to this, but as many of you, I think, who come from similar backgrounds to me, I always had this sense that I was in some ways an accidental American, that by dint of the apocalypse of the European Jewish 20th century, I had ended up speaking English and being born in New York City, as opposed to being born in Vienna, like my grandfather, well, my grandfather wasn't born in Vienna, but outside in Europe, um, and then grew up in Vienna, or Tel Aviv, like my cousins, or someplace else. It seemed like that the dial had been spun. And because of that, um, and I was very, very conscious of how privileged he felt to be an American. And at the same time, I was constantly investigating that identity. What did it mean to be him? What did it mean to have grown up in one way and then left everything you knew? And I only saw it in really heroic terms, really basic terms, that he had escaped with the essential people in this sort of remarkable way as anybody who escaped did. And I didn't really press on the sort of really smooth stories we'd been told. Uh, and the beginning for me of thinking about outside of that was actually after he had died, but my grandmother was still living and I was sort of rooting around in my grandfather's old office, uh, which if you can picture it, it had this sort of mid-century couch and all of these volumes and volumes and volumes in German and a bust of Goethe and a bust of Heim Weizmann and Apollo. And in the back of one of these cabinets, there was an old photo album with sort of photo corners and filled with images of my grandfather in, in Europe and Vienna and in the mountains outside Vienna in the 30s. And then out of it fell a folded note of the kind that people used to pass in class. Um, but this had obviously been sent by mail. And in each quadrant of the note was sort of a selfie, if you will, of this woman. And under it, a, you know, a quote, you know, will Carl write to me today or no letter? And I showed it to my grandmother and she said, oh, that was his true love. And she left the room and didn't answer further. And I went at that point, his 
his sister, um, Celie, was still living, and she was living in New Jersey at that time after many, many, many years of living in Queens. And she she said to me, this was Valerie Sheftel. She had come alone to study medicine at the University of Vienna from Czechoslovakia, where she was from. Uh, she'd fallen in love with my grandfather immediately, and he had at first ignored her, and then he ran to t see her, and they had this whirlwind romance. They planned to escape together, and instead he escaped with the people that I knew he'd escaped with, his sister, who I was speaking to, his mother and his nephew and his brother-in-law. And she talked about it for a while on the phone, and then she typed me a letter and put it in the mail and said, I I've always wondered what happened to her. Maybe you're the one to find out. And at the time I thought, what more could I tell you really? I mean, I didn't know how, I didn't know what to do when I had only these very, the sort of very barest bones of a story, but it started me thinking about all I didn't know and how much I'd been told and about how the narrative that we had polished and told again and again, and we knew stories of loss, but that there were so many absences necessarily so that people would live their lives. But I started wondering more and more about what did it mean to leave and what did it mean to be a refugee and what did it mean to be um, a survivor and what did it mean to uh, have changed your life entirely at the age of 26 as my grandfather did. And I started thinking about this in my work even before I started looking for her and I started reporting around stories that were sort of beyond the kind of big pieces, right? As I, I think Sherry and I talked about this the other day, that even those of us who grew up with Holocaust refugees and, you know, former children of the kinder transport at our Shabbat dinner tables, even for us, the time has collapsed. So you think of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, and then maybe Auschwitz, or, or maybe you think of a yellow star and then Auschwitz, and then you think of survival or, or the alternative. And I started thinking about all the years in between. Uh, and in particular, I did this one major piece in Paris that really changed the trajectory of how I thought about the Holocaust. And it was a, that there had been a discovery by two historians, one named Jean-Marc Dreyfus and actually a sociologist named Sarah Gensberger. And they had started working on three forgotten slave labor camps in the heart of Paris that had been staffed by Jews who had some privilege in some way or another, who weren't being deported immediately. And those Jews were tasked with this terrible task, which was to erase the Jews being deported. The, the French moving companies were contracted by the Gestapo to strip every apartment that a Jew had, had been taken from. And then all their things were brought to these three depots. And in those depots, their things were separated. So all the cribs and armoires and plates and pots and pans, anything reusable on their furniture were sent into the Reich to bomb victims. And all their personal effects, their journals and their photographs, anything that identified them as human, intellectual, or interesting, or different, as someone they were told to burn. And I kept thinking about this, and I kept thinking of Vali. And I thought, what does it mean that this woman, I don't know her story, what happened to her? Did she survive? Did she not survive? What happened to regular people? What happened to the Sarah Wildmans if we don't know their story? And I kept thinking about this more and more around, uh, and that's when I started thinking more and more, is there something that I could do to tell the story. And Jean-Marc Dreyfus, who was the historian that wrote this book, Des Camps en Paris, about these three camps with Sarah Gensberger, said to me, you know, there, he was among the many people, including the Holocaust Museum, who mentioned there were there were unopened Holocaust archives uh, called the International Tracing Service in Bad Arlson. And I started thinking, when those archives open, and there's a lot of agitation to open them, when they open, maybe I could go and then that way I would look for her because that they'd, what they'd been originally used for was searching for survivors and victims and reuniting families with the end of their story because providing that closure, that arc was something that people were desperate for after the war. So to some degree, these the this, this sort of start points of when I begin to look for Vali are at various points, right? One is just this very sense of always being kind of obsessed with knowing more as much as I possibly could know about my family's story. Um, and then suddenly really with like a slip of paper realizing there was so much more I hadn't been told. And then wondering if I could kind of combine my work as a journalist um, and as a grandchild of, 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 a, of a refugee, what, what could those two, how could I meld those two things? And that's kind of where the story begins. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of us who grow up hearing our family story or certain parts of our family stories want to know what is unsaid 
we want to know what's in the ellipses. Um, and, you know, you talk a little bit about just now your grandfather's identity, and I'm curious if you can talk about how your grandfather's identity changed or your understanding of it changed as you learned more about his story, as you learned more about Vali's story and what that was like for you, for your image of this man who was so central to your life and your identity, for that to shift after he's gone. So as you mentioned at the beginning, my grandfather lived with enormous joy um, and, you know, he was sort of filled with a kind of joie de vivre that it has been, I, I think I've been in pursuit of my whole life. Like, how does somebody live that way um, when also in retrospect, having lost a great deal or so much? And so, but I had some in some respects, had sort of always seen him as that way. And, and I think that that is who he was. I mean, I think that's who he was in Vienna and who he was in the United States. But it also came to be seen to me as a form of a form of his survival, right? So he, he takes on this identity because when he arrived in the United States, one of the things that really shifted for me about his identity was that we had always seen him as this tremendous success. He'd come to the U.S., he'd started a practice, he was so fortunate that he had already had his medical degree, he came, he set up a practice, he joins the U.S. Army, he somehow rises to the rank of major, and then he has this very successful practice, and by 1950, he begins to travel around the world. At the beginning of 1950, he actually goes back, and I have pictures of him in, in bombed out Vienna, um, he goes back looking for people, and then he goes on to uh, Israel to look for survivors and meet with his relatives. And, you know, in retrospect, one of the things I really started thinking about was as he starts to meet people and goes back to Europe and goes around the world, kind of picking up the pieces of those who've survived, I realized that actually, you know, so, so many of these people he hasn't seen in 12 years, right? It's been a very long time. I mean, in the life of someone who's, you've gone from being a 26-year-old, you know, recent a uh, medical school graduate to being um, a father, a doctor, a major in the army. Um, but what I hadn't known that the research brought me to was that when he arrived in the United States, he was all but penniless. And that there had been a group called the National, uh, the National Committee for the Resettlement of, of Foreign Physicians. And it was, it was a long and kind of cumbersome title, but they had been tasked with, or tasked themselves, with helping Jewish refugee physicians find spots in the U.S. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because there were the weird little slips of paper, um, <clears throat> I'm actually, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly, but that I found, um, that showed that he had received these checks in very tiny amounts at times, $22 and $18 and $100. And it turned out that he had written to them from Vienna. He'd written trying to find spots for himself from Vienna. But in the United States, he arrives in the United States, which is really, really, really not interested in receiving Jewish refugee physicians. And the AMA was actively at lobbying against Jewish, ref Jewish refugee physicians from not just the AMA, but there were, in state legislatures across the country, Jewish refugee physicians were being told that they wouldn't be licensed for several years, which for many people meant that they had to find entirely new careers. So by 1943, I think there were only three states left that would license Jewish refugee physicians upon arrival. But because of this group, he not only gets started in the Northwest of Massachusetts, but he also provides me this weird paper trail where I'm able to see that this, this like tremendous person, this person who lived with this joie de vivre, this person who, you know, ran all over the world with my grandmother eventually, um, I am able to find out that he has basically nothing. That in, when he first arrives here, there are notes between social workers discussing that his mother has sold the last of her jewelry and netting her $60, and that beyond that, they have nothing. And he writes to them saying that he's finally set up a practice with their help. They're asking because it's actually loans, and they're trying to sort of recycle the money to help out other physicians. He writes to them saying that he's only uh, he's only netted $18 that month, and could he have a slight extension? And at the same time, I come to understand that, you know, dozens of people are writing him from Europe, asking him for money and help and affidavits. Um, and some way or another, one friend writes to him saying, could you construct um, a, a 
a place for me at a university so that I can say I have a university position and then I can use that to get around the visa system. So everyone's getting caught in the system of quotas. They're trying to get out. Um, it's getting harder and harder and harder to leave, even though this is long before the star goes on. And what I come to understand is that he's carrying with him for his whole life, really, this burden of the people that he can help and the people he can do nothing about. He's relatively powerless in the United States, as most people were, right? I mean, we've come to know now that, uh, for example, Otto Frank and Frank's father had written to the heir to the Macy's fortune, and he still couldn't get himself visas in the United States by the time he was writing them. So if someone with those kind of connections is also writing and finding, you know, it's coming up against walls, uh, someone like my grandfather, who has no connections and quite literally, you know, has sold the last of his mother's jewelry to net him $60, really has very, very, very little. And so for me, the idea that he comes from that and is able to build himself into the person that he that he maybe had always been, but was able to retain that without any kind of um, bitterness uh, is, is even more remarkable, right? And at the same time, you, one wonders, how do you, as, as a sense of self-preservation, live with all the people that you can't help? Uh, because, and does he save their letters? And what we haven't gotten to is, so some years after, um, around the time I discovered that Bad Arlson was opening, I came across a, a box of letters, which I still own, and it was a sort of file box from the 40s that was sort of disintegrating, labeled patient correspondence A through G. This was after my grandmother died and people were sort of taking things apart in their house. And I idly opened it one night and it was filled with these rubber, you know, packages of letters, like packs with rubber bands that sort of disintegrated as I touched them and don't have any snap left. And I realized they're not from patients at all. They're from his entire exploded Viennese world and all these people saying, what can you do to help me? And the just the sheer emotion of these letters, um, even relatively early on, right? So we were talking about fall of 38, even before Kristallnacht, then certainly after Kristallnacht, and then everything after that until the U.S. enters the war, the letters become increasingly, increasingly desperate. Uh, and it's there's very, very, very little that he possibly could have done, certainly monetarily, and yet here he's held on to them. And it makes me wonder, does he hold them because he feels some responsibility to them, even to the degree that they were able to move or not move? I mean, and, and even some people who find relative safety or an extreme discomfort, certainly relatively, the people that he knew who ends up in Shanghai uh, are, are suffering. They're having a very, very, very hard time of it. Um, there is somebody that he writes to, that writes to him who's a, a former friend from medical school who's been placed in an internment camp for uh, enemy aliens, because many German nationals were were placed into internment camps. He was placed in one in in a, in a sort of holding camp in Australia, and he writes to him saying, "I'm terribly bored. Can you send uh, textbooks so that I can keep up with my studies?" It's interesting that that so much of what you experience of his identity, that so much of what these experiences are sort of bouncing up against is his joy, you know, is this identity of, of strength and, and joy and power in a way, right? You know him as this very powerful man and he experiences this time of, of having absolutely no power um, and yet somehow comes back from that. I think as a reader, one of the things that struck me immediately, and of course we're primed as readers to be struck by it because of the title of your book, is this question of love. Mm -hmm. Is this question of this woman who loved him, who ostensibly he loves, who your grandmother calls his true love. And I'm curious as his grandchild and in some ways as his biographer, as you learn more about what happens to Vali, as you read her letters, as you read some of his letters back to her, how you, how that question of love is, is, exists for you and how it's challenged for you as you experience her Holocaust story. So, I, you know, so I think that there's, what I, I think I mentioned this to you the other day when we spoke in advance, that what I started to feel were that there were two, there were several different love stories taking place at once. One is that my grandfather retains this sort of perfect sense of 
the past in some strange way and it, and actually really remarkable way because one of the things i find out um and those of you who've read the book will know this is that the university of vienna was a bastion of of nazi activity in the 30s before hitler comes into vienna and in fact there are clashes between nazi youth <laughs> and and Jews, and, and so much so that um, a professor there who has worked on refugee physicians and, and refugee students um, says, well, the best uh, description of this is written by a man named Benno Weiser Verone, and he, he sends me a text, and I said, well, it's very strange because it's my grandfather's best friend. He was among his three best friends. He had, and Benno ends up in, in Quito, Ecuador, um, because as like all stories are remarkable, he had been the tutor to the Ecuadorian ambassador's son, and he writes to him at some point and asks for help getting out. And the kid impresses upon his father how much he liked his tutor, and the and the father uh, helps the family get out. Uh, and so Beno ends up in Quito, Ecuador, um, and much much later on ends up becoming an ambassador from Israel to to South America. Anyway, to Paraguay. In any case, um, he writes this 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 piece, which is part of a book he wrote called. Um, Professions of a Lucky Jew, I think. I'll have to look downstairs or I'll Google it quickly before we hang up. Um, but in any case, about uh, clashes, um, big, big fights uh, in the halls of the medical school uh, between uh, Nazi supporters and Jews. And so my grandfather's Vienna was not exactly the same uh, Vienna that I'd been told it was, even from the outset. So it's already a bit rosy tinged. And yet there is this perfection to Vienna in his mind that he carries forever. You know, the culture of the food, the um, the music, um, the literature, and he feels himself very much a part of this and never wants to let it go. And I come to wonder if Vali, in his mind and in my grandmother's, is as much the past and this entire world that my grandmother only sort of can visit but never really fully has access to because it's not where she grew up. And then you have Vali's love story, which is that for Vali, as her world is stripped away from her, and one of the things I tried to do with the book is really sort of show you how over time this incredibly modern woman who comes alone to study medicine and isn't particularly interested in marriage or kids, um, and she doesn't really mention marriage for a really long time in her letters, and she's reduced slowly, slowly over time to one identity, which is of that of a Jewish woman, um, and, you know, she's not being allowed to buy clothes or shoes or be able to purchase eggs or all these things that start to pile up for her as 1940 becomes 1941. She then is also living in the past in a different way, right? She's living in this halcyonic time where they don't have any money, but they're so romantic and they take these trips together and they hike in the mountains and they go to Italy and they go skiing and they're, they go out to these lakes in the, um, in the Austrian countryside. And, and she says in some of her letters, at which point of the life of, of, the, of the past are you living in? And I think to myself all the time of, I'm living in this time. I'm living in the time of going to these mountains. I'm living in the time of us going to the medical students ball. And she then is caught in a love affair that is as much about the past as it is um, it, as it is about whatever she might imagine might be to come, right? And I think that both of them are in some strange way, love becomes something else. So for my grandfather, it's a way of accessing his past. And for Vali, I think it's a path towards potential survival. If she can see this relationship realized, it will mean she's survived this terrible time. He talks about how she doesn't have a present. You know, she can't even really think about anything else other than the future and the past because her present is is not something she can think about. And she doesn't tell him exactly the restrictions she's under when she writes that because she can't. All of her letters are being opened and, and censored in some way. And so I think that for me, you know, people have asked me about this a lot, about this question of true love. And, and I always have wondered, you know, if this, if the Holocaust hadn't happened, would it be I dated a really wonderful girl um, I hope she's doing well. She now lives in Brussels. Um, or, you know, or is it that something that happened before the war becomes preserved in a different way, before this time where everything collapses, where all these people are never again assembled in one place? Um, oh, thanks. Um, you know, is it that? 
is it is it because thank you um is it that she that it's a truly um truly about love and and partly maybe it is right but it's not just it's not like someone in peacetime saying that they still love someone else from the past it just isn't because it's caught up in absolutely everything else it's caught up in everything that changes around them and all those that are lost and I think that that's why it's so much more complicated than saying like, oh, this is his true love. I mean, I think in some ways that was the wry aspect of it, which was, was his true love Vienna and everything that had come before as much as it was Folly herself? I think there's something so powerful about this idea of there's no future, there's, there's excuse me, there's only the future, there's only the past, there's no current moment. You know, I, when you and I talked and, and you said it just before about this idea of collapsing these moments, I think part of it is because it is impossible to understand what it means to live in a world that's collapsing around you, right? What it means to live in a ghetto, what it means to live in the house you've always lived in, but now there's 25 other people there and you don't have your job and you don't have enough food and what it means to do that for years on end. I mean, part of what I was so struck by reading your book is just the impossibility of Jews living in Berlin in 1943 and knowing that these people are going to be killed, but they haven't, they don't know that and they haven't gotten there yet. But right? the, the kind of slowness with which history moves. And in that way, Avali's letters are a really powerful artifact, right? They don't just tell the story of what's happening to her and answer what is our question, which is, does she live or does she die? but they address so many other questions that in some way are just as important as does she live, does she die? It's what does it mean to live this way? How do people maintain their humanity during these experiences? And I think you do an incredible job of, of bringing these letters to life. And, and I know for me reading them, you know, they're, they're incredibly intimate. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered what that was like for you, not just experiencing this, you know, quite literally in many ways, hidden part of your grandfather's life, but what it felt like to publish her words, you know, her, her words and his words and these sort of private words and many people's private words are, are really a theme throughout your book. I and mean, what that's like for you as a journalist um, who I imagine publishes people's private experiences with their consent frequently, but also as a, as a granddaughter, as a historian, sort of all the, all the hats you wear in this book. So it's interesting, it's really, really early on when I first found the letters, um, I, I sent them to a bunch of my German native speaking friends for help. First of all, her German um, is very, um, there's certain words she uses that are not used anymore. Um, you know, there it's it's caught in a certain kind of 1930s sort of slang, apparently. Um, but one of my friends said, "Oh, I, I can't translate this. This is this is too personal. I I, I don't actually think this is fair." And um, and it's interesting you say that because also I I gave a talk at Wesleyan where I went to school, um, and someone in the audience said the same thing. How could you use these? And I said it's interesting because just a few years ago a, a private correspondence was found between suffragettes. Um, and you wouldn't really think twice about, you know, reading the letters between suffragettes because you'd think, okay, we want to learn more about the suffragettes and how they went about their battle. And that's sort of how I took on this idea too, which was, yes, at first, I mean, first of all, I, I mean, I didn't publish the book for a number of years after I first found the letters, but beyond that, um, even after I got help translating all of them and I got through them, I started feeling like it was a responsibility to have found them and that these were a form of witnessing that we wouldn't normally have access to. And as intimate as it was, and of course I couldn't ask her what she wanted. At the same time, the idea of allowing her to be erased by not letting her tell her story herself felt to me like just a right? It just, here she was, this, she's this incredibly modern woman. She has this very, very beautiful writing style. Um, and she's really giving you a window, especially what, or at least what I tried to do and hopefully successfully did. Um, if you've nestled it in, in between 
understanding what's really happening for her as she writes. So as she's requesting things and all the things that she's saying are good. I mean, at the beginning when she says, you know, she's gotten work in the kindergarten seminar in Berlin, she has left her town because the small town that she was from had been given to Germany as part of the Sudetenland. And in those areas, anti-Semitism becomes in incredibly intolerable, especially because it's impossible to hide, even though this is actually several years before the Yellow Star goes on, right? And we think of the time before as not having been a time of restriction, but actually restrictions are closing and closing and closing. And she describes these moments of joy. And what I try to do is research around what she tells us, right? They sort of call it, um, you know, reading between the lines more or less, right? So, you know, when she says she's been found work in the kindergarten seminar, I found a historian of the kindergarten seminar. And you, what you find out is it's one of the last places that people can work, that Jews can work. So all of a sudden it's these sort of, you know, leading figures of, of, their, of the city, you know, sort of, leading, you know, theater directors are, are speaking to high school girls um, and that there's all, it's a sort of bastion of culture in Berlin. And it's a time in Berlin where Jews are actually feeling safer than they were in some of the parts of, in some of the external parts of the Reich because there's so many more people and Berlin was sort of still not externally hurting people in the street in the same way. And so she has these moments in between and when she talks about not having a present, it's what she doesn't tell him is that she's been forced into a Judenhäuser, these sort of like, I think of them as almost apartment sized ghettos where, you know, apartments that once housed two people or four people or even a family of six, they now all of a sudden had to house 10 or 15 people and everybody's sleeping there together and having to get to their forced labor assignments and also eventually being forced to, you know, shop between in one hour a day and between each of their, each of the places they have to go, the butcher, the you know the, the dairy you know buying things because of course it's not you know going to whole foods or whatever it is just to go to each vendor you know the bakery and you know as more and more things are taken from them what they're able to do for me i felt that this was um something akin to what the french call uh, lieu de memoir these places of memory that this is some sort of a place of memory that this that these letters themselves are almost like a diary, even though they hadn't been meant to be seen by the outside world. Most diaries aren't. Uh, and, you know, as I've, I mentioned to you the other day, that though Anne Frank is, of course, one of the most famous Holocaust victims, if not the most famous, in fact, first person narratives were really not seen in the same way in the first years of historiography around the Holocaust. And then we're more and more understanding that I think that these kinds of narratives around, um, around an individual woman's story who isn't someone that you would have known about because she's not, you know, a mayor and she doesn't, you know, own a major business. Um, she's not someone that you would read about otherwise. And for me, this felt incredibly important because one of the things the Holocaust does is that it flattens identity. And, it, it, and no matter what, even for those of us who spend a great deal of time reading all we can about the Holocaust and listening to every survivor we can listen to, um, it's hard to not lose sight of people as individuals. And I felt that these letters gave us an insight into what it would mean to be a regular woman who's 26 to 31. You can really picture her, you know, and she's already accomplished so much. She's gone alone to study medicine. She leaves her mother who raised her alone you know, from the age of two, who her mother was a shop owner, but she'd been successful enough and that they had been intellectual enough that she was able to go and study. She's done all these things. She should have been, you know, had a career in medicine. And, but it's not the type of person you read about, you know, and, and it gives you texture to understanding the loss in a different way. And so for me, as intimate as these are, in addition to the fact that it gives me greater insight into my grandfather and what kind of person he was and what this all meant, it also gives you greater insight into what it meant to be a young person in the war who wants nothing more than to go back to life and what it means to lose life all around you, what it means to be excised from society, you know, one restriction at a time. It's really different from the Holocaust in the East, right? It's not roundups. It's not sudden. They start to hear things, right? In 1940, they start to hear about roundups and they start worrying. But for a long time, they live 
just as things are just winnowing down for them, the things that they're losing things day by day, and the Jewish publications are having to publish their restrictions day by day by day, and they're losing things left and right. I mean, I kept these lists, um, you know, there've been lists published that I had help with translating to just sort of see because the restrictions in Berlin are published incrementally in this incredible way. You know, first in January of 1940, you know, they're no longer allowed to buy clothes or shoes. And then, then later they're banned from resoling their shoes or repairing their clothes or trading clothes. They're banned from bicycles and telephones and typewriters and fish and coffee and fruit. And that's all in January of 1941. I mean, it, all these things start happening like slowly, slowly, slowly. You can't imagine how anyone's able to feed themselves. And what does that feel like? What does that look like? And at the same time, she's constantly writing him saying, I still get to serve as a doctor. She doesn't say to him that she's no longer allowed to be called a doctor, but she gets to work in medicine. And the, she sort of grasps onto joy in these small spaces of trying to, and she sort of tries to recreate for herself you know, in her mind, the sort of symphonies that they went to, and she mentions things, Pierre Gint and Solveig's song. Um, and later on, I discover, and much later, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that um, there were sort of these underground salons that some of these young people had where people had kept contraband phonographs um, and would play very, very, very quietly um, their records so that they could sort of close their eyes and pretend they were at the symphony. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but many survivors said to me, you know, the things that they missed, right, were just the ability to go to the movies or just the ability to, you know, go to a concert. Um, and this, I, I meet a woman, and I can't remember if she's I, I, the name Hani, um, and when I went to the um, the Silent Hero Memorial in, in Berlin, and she tells me the story of hiding in the movie theater. And like, there's so many people who talk to me about just losing the movies alone. Um, just losing this like sort of just basic ability to be a part of the world and what and what that does for them, what that does to their psyche, what it means to have to do drudgery constantly. And it's not yet even the camps, which of course, you know, are a whole other type of horror. It's just this slow removal of all things normal from themselves. And I feel like the intimacy of all these letters allow us to understand and care. And what does it mean? for a regular person. And so I guess that's why I felt it was important to publish them. Yeah, I, I understand that completely. I mean, I think understanding the regular people is is really the, the purpose of history at this point, right? We know the whys, mm -hmm. the big whys, you know, the sort of great men theories of history, but to understand Vali's experience as a 27, 28 year old, 29 year old Jewish woman is, exceptional and and especially when you you speak about the texture of it right kind of like the depth of access to her experience that you get and the openness there was a exhibition years ago um about you know the the ringelblum archive and the exhibition was called scream the truth at the world and there's something in Vali's letters that made me think about of that but it's almost more whisper the truth right like kind of seduce seduce the world with the truth that just to to softly, in a very human way, speak to this experience, it, it's not just about the horror. She's, she talks so clearly about beauty. And so when she's not talking about beauty, I think it, it really comes into you deeply. And I, I also hear part of what you're saying is about witnessing and the responsibility you feel about witnessing. I also should say for everyone, in case you're not seeing the chat, we're gonna start taking questions in about five minutes. So if you wanna put questions in the chat, I'll be able to ask some of them to Sarah. Um, this question of witnessing, you know, I was really struck when you were speaking at the beginning of, of you talking to your aunt and she says, well, maybe you'll be the one to tell this story. That's not a small burden. Even mm -hmm. if it's a welcome burden, it's not a small burden to have on you. And I think plenty of people on this call today are second or third generation and understand the feeling of, I have to be the one to, tell this story. And of course, for you, it ended up not just being your family's story, but Vali's story as well. And it's it's not a small decision to take on, and not just because you spent what seems to be like a decade, you know, traveling all over Europe, pregnant, with, and then with your daughter at home, um, far away from your partner, living with a, essentially a neo-Nazi in, in Vienna, 
people who haven't read the book, you should really read the book, if only for the story of Sarah living with this woman in Vienna. Um, but that it's a big decision to take on too because, because of what it does to you. You know, you, you say that it becomes in your blood and in your bones this history. And it's also, it you give something of yourself when you decide to make your professional life your personal life and your personal history. I know that from doing it myself in a different way. Um, so I wonder if, uh, you know, we we'll to take questions in just a few minutes, but if you can speak to to that experience, to that sense of responsibility, and I, I'll add a PS to that, which is having finished the book, does that responsibility feel resolved? So, Gosh, it's such a, it's a big question. It's hard to say. So first of all, um, I want to go back to the archives for a minute because it'll, I think it'll help us think about this a little bit. When it, when I finally get to the archives, um, and Jean-Marc actually was there, Dreyfus, the, the historian I mentioned, um, and actually early on, before we even get in, we all take a group trip to Bergen-Belsen. Um, and then we went into the archives and the archives at the time were not yet digitized. Now, if people are aware, ITS, you can write to them and you can actually write to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has a copy of the digital archives, although it's scans so that they're very, very, they're hard to, a little bit hard to use without someone to help you navigate. But at the time, they weren't digitized at all. And walking into them was like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? You know, where it's just miles and miles and miles of boxes and you know there are probably, you know, something very, very, very important here, but it's hard to know how to find it. And there, what I wanted to know, at the first thing I wanted to know was whether or not someone else had come searching for Vali and someone else had, right? And they had a file for her, something called a tracing and documentation file, which meant someone had requested her in front of me. And it turned out it wasn't my grandfather. It was a woman writing from London in the 50s and then in the early 60s. Uh, and it's connected to a file to a man named Hans Fabisch. And it meant that Volley had actually married someone after the US enters the war. Um, and that to me, I didn't know what to do with at the time. But when I went to see the tracing and documentation files, the first, before they'd been digitized, it was in this old maid or driving school and there were stacks and stacks and stacks of paper, you know, in, in, in thousand page stacks. And every single one was a request for information. Do you know anything about my family? Am I the only one who survived my town? Someone saw my son and I, I'm sure he's still living. You have to tell me he's still living because my husband is no longer living and my son is the only thing I have. You have to tell me my son is still living. And those, and that sort of desperation and the chaos of the post-war period and the sense that um, of trying to not just find closure, but find each other and sort of come out from under these many, many, many years of, uh, of, of Nazi control sort of pulled me even further in. And there were so many different points where I felt pulled further and further and further in. I, I felt I couldn't really let it go. And yet for a very long time, I felt that I wasn't able to do justice to the request of my aunt, right? I was, how was I ever going to truly find the full arc of the story? And I realized that actually searching for one person was not actually what I was doing. I was sort of looking for a universe of people because we don't, one of the things that my grandfather had presented to us, the idea of him escaping with everyone or the way that I had absorbed it as a child um, did not allow for the universe we live in. We're not sort of atoms bouncing around the universe alone. Um, and that doesn't mean, and then in this case, it meant his, he, it, I hadn't really thought about what had happened to his half brother or what had happened to his cousins or what had happened to his nieces. I had, but I hadn't really thought about it in the context of his escape. What did it mean to what did it mean to lose your whole community and 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 the way your community existed? And then not just the people you knew you would stay in touch with, but even just the sort of ambient people, the people you went to school with, the people you shopped from, the people that you saw on the street every day because your entire neighborhood was Jewish. I started thinking more and more about this and I, I couldn't really let it go. And could it be, and I felt that I had to find out as much as possible. And it comes to be that Hans Fabisch also becomes for me something of a quest because 
finding out who he was and telling his story ends up for me becoming a really, really important part of this as well. So so much of the story is about Vali, but when I discovered that she'd married someone who was a decade younger than her, which I felt like had to be a story behind it. And it turned out, and I don't want to give too much away, but it turned out that the loss of Hans had been this source of incredible pain to this family that was based in the UK, that had been just, uh, I'll sort of give a bit of background. So I, I placed uh, classified, a classified ad, an old survivor newsletter in the UK, uh, at, listing everything I knew about the woman who had come searching for Vali. And I happened to be in London a couple months after I placed it. And I always say that like, if I'd written this into fiction, you'd say it's too ridiculous, like this couldn't really possibly happen. Um, but it was really how it happened. I had asked this conference if I could stay an extra night in London so I could like go to the Tate and be in London and not just in a conference room. And they had agreed. Jean-Marc was there, who's like sort of constantly in, in the story, but it was really true. He was really there. He came and met me at the Tate. Um, he wasn't at the conference, but he came and met me and we went to the Tate. And he argued with me and he said, you really have to start writing. And I said, I can't write. I don't know the full story yet. I can't do it. I'm not going to do her justice. I don't have enough. You know, and at that point, I have retraced her steps fully. Like I have been in her hometown. I've been in Vienna. I've been in Berlin. I've walked all over. I tried to see all the places she wrote from. I went to all these places and he said, what, what more? and I had all of her letters where I thought, right? And he said, well, what more do you want? I said, I can't, I don't know what happens after we enter the war. I feel like I need more. I wanted to know more. And, he, you know, and he, and I think he felt that it was an unreasonable thought, which kind of was, you know, but then I get this email that night from this woman saying, imagine my emotion. I'm the youngest daughter of the searcher. I don't know if you're ever in London. And I was like, oh my God. And of course she'd included no phone number, you know. And I was like, you know, we have here till four o'clock tomorrow. And she came and met me and it unravels the whole rest of the story, but in part meeting her and Hans was her uncle um, and us together eventually later on. And I, I don't want to tell you too much, but um, reading Hans's letters and then learning what Hans tried to do for Vali and understanding the ways in which humanities continue to exist, even as things are really, really, really collapsing around them. Uh, was both, was somehow affirming in many, many ways, in addition to the fact that it really gave Hans back a place, you know, which I felt really thrilled to be able to do, you know, that, that, it, that this story became his too, and that we understood that this 21-year-old, if you can imagine, you know, this 21-year-old young man who had been forced to stop school too young and that all these things he tries to do to maintain an intellectual life and have a life um and that also that this marriage as i had one i had suspected there was something behind it surely had come in part because he thought he was a more essential worker than she was and understanding all of that but but to your final point of does it end it as I was working and working on the book and I kept coming up with more and more things and searching and searching and searching, I wrote to an author in the in Spain named Javier Circas, who's written a lot on the Spanish Civil War. Um, and he's worked a lot on both his families. He has his most recent book is about his family's history, but he's written both fiction and nonfiction. And I said, how do you, um, how do you stop? How do you, how, how can you, how can I possibly stop searching? How can I possibly like hit send and be done? And he said, you don't. I mean, this is paraphrasing the poet, I think it was Paul Salon. Uh, you abandon, you have to walk away. Um, it's what is, it's what's been said about poetry. You never finish a poem, you abandon it. I have to look up who said it because I'm, <laughs> um, but in any case, he, um, and, and he was, I mean, hang on, I'll tell you what it is. Um, I think that that to me, um, that pain of not being able ever able to stop. Um, um, here I'm trying to tell you what it was. Um, let's see, who is it from? Oh, Paul Valery. Um, I think that pain of not be, of knowing that the work will always be incomplete is why you then know that it's not just about Vali, right? The story, of course it is about her and you wanna give her the fullest possible story you can give her. And of course it's about Hans, but it's it's not. It's about the fact that no matter what you do, that you, you could spend your entire life searching and you wouldn't be able to tell all these stories. And it's, you know, it's like Pierre K. Avot, you know, you, you know, you can't abandon the work, but you know, you're not you're not required to finish it, but nor can you walk away. So in some ways, I guess it's contrary to the poet, right? 
you're just always working. In some ways, you will always be working. The book had to finish because, you know, I had a deadline. But, um, <laughs> but, and I tried to wrap it up as best as I could. But, you know, it's since then, um, I've taken my kids, um, I took my kids to Vienna two summers ago. Um, and we walked through the neighborhood. And now, of course, there's Stolperstein everywhere, the small brass stumbling blocks, which show you the stories. And my children are young. So we've only begun to talk about these things. Uh, but we went to my grandfather's house, um, you know, and we met up with many of my friends who I've made in, in Vienna. And, and, and we have this sense that as much as I don't want to pass trauma to my children, that I am starting the process. And that's also part of the work of talking to them about it. Um, you know, and I think that's a piece of it. I think it's such a beautiful way to put it that it's never going to be finished. You just have to abandon it because there's something about it that says to me, it means that whatever you can do perhaps is enough, right? And it also means that for all those of us walking around with this feeling of, I need to find a way to tell the story. I need to find a way to find the answers. I need to remember every single thing I can remember. It just means that's just how we're going to feel. And it doesn't mean we've done anything wrong with it you know and and I mean I'm someone who's my grandmother just died and so it's there's so many of those questions of that feeling of I must do everything in my power and your reminder that our power is limited here I think is a really good one and that perhaps where we need to be looking is is towards how we tell the story next um I have to wrap up in two minutes but you say something beautiful. I mean, you say very many beautiful things, but you say something beautiful in your story about the, about the construction of, of a narrative, about the way, you know, your grandfather sort of, he put together, you call it, I think, a considered construction, right? A wholesale creation of the narrative. And then he passed that along and that got passed along to you and you'll pass it along to your children. But of course, now there's another narrative that you can, add there's so much more to it. And I think about your your meeting in London with Hans's sister. And to me, I, I read that and I felt comforted for you that you weren't in it alone. You know, you'd found someone also searching the way you were searching. And I, I think maybe that's a lesson for all of us reading your book too, of of just reading it and saying, I'm not the only one who feels these things. And my God, look what she was able to do with these feelings, because what you did is remarkable. Um, I, I think that, um, wait, I just, I'll just correct that it was his niece, um, his sister, I did not meet his sister because his sister had passed away, but- I'm um, oh, sorry, his niece. Was his niece, but, um, and actually I saw that when I posted this to Facebook, she commented, I wish I could come, but it's late, you know, in the UK. Um, I don't, I felt so, so, so fortunate to meet her. Um, in, in June of 1986, my grandfather writes to his friend, one of the, one of the men that he went to medical school. Um, he writes, my dear Bruno, my question remains, does unlimited freedom to come and go, to stay or leave, to attend or ignore, to eat or to starve, to read or to dream, create a vacuum, or is it paradise at last? Sorry, our dog is a lunatic. Um, yesterday, I went out in a canoe by myself along the shoreline and across the lake. They had a house on the lake. I had an airlevness, an experience which I hadn't had for over 50 years. For half a century, I was racing by in a speedboat. In this half century, I saw the shoreline a thousand times, but I had no concomitant inner experience. It was meaningless, empty adventure. Yesterday's airlevness connected so wonderfully with the water, the shoreline, the little houses I had known as a young man. There was meaning, there was an echo, strange people greeted me. There was an exhilarating sense of self in this wide world, as a self I used to know, a marvelous antidote to deadening routine. We have to stop racing and all that it implies that there is a future, that tomorrow is more important than today. We have to assign overwhelming importance to the day and to our act, our performance on this day. We have to summon our accumulated experience and our accumulated resources to fashion a day that we can live with in Zuckin delight. Please try. I think this to me was what he tried to do. He really, really, really tried to, I mean, it's sort of like people say in yoga classes all the time, sort of live in the moment, be in the moment, be present. Um, and that that sense that he was able to do that, to somehow recognize that that would be his best 
that that would be a, a form of survival would be, you know, to me was was obviously a very considered effort. Um, I noticed that there is one question in the chat I will answer um, that somebody asked if, we, if my grandfather expressed guilt or sorrow about having left Ollie behind. Um, he, there's only one draft of a letter that I found from him in this collection of letters uh, where he talks about tremendous, tremendous sadness. And there is a, a, a sketch almost of a printout and then notes on it, almost like he was on the phone with Hyas uh, with notes about her uh, on it. And so I don't know if he expressed guilt or sorrow, but her name had come up and, and I would hear strange things that someone said, well, I heard that she was like Florence Nightingale uh, or there was some way in which she had been preserved in this sort of sense of beauty and perfection. And so while I don't know about guilt, because I, I think for some reason he tried to, he's compartmentalized that kind of concept out, but he certainly seems to ex have expressed sorrow um, and had obviously tried in some ways to look for her or reach out to her. I suspect that there were letters between him and her through the Red Cross. And because I had tried to search for that towards the end of the book, but it was a bit of a needle in a haystack kind of moment because um, after the U.S. enters the war, you could send notes through the Red Cross, but they were sort of poems. They were sort of very, very, very short. And then they're very, very hard to find unless they were preserved by the family. I found one or two empty Red Cross envelopes, which were extremely tantalizing and kind of terrible at the same time. Um, I, I don't know. I think he was able to... There was... I think he attended to the people who were living. And, and one of the things I thought about a lot was I reached out to a cousin um, whose mother had lost a child at the beginning of the, at the end of the war that he hadn't known about. And he said, well, it was easy for me to, it, or her letter is very unclear. Every German speaker I showed it to is that we're all unclear whether she had lost her, if she's describing losing her a son, a brother, or her husband. Her husband is, the first husband she does is her first husband. But she says our oldest, which is it's hard to explain what that means. But the the son who I read this letter to, which is a letter filled with enormous pain um, and anger at my grandfather, says, "Well, you know, for you it's easy to ask these questions because you were born so far after the war. For us, it was literally unspeakable." And and I think that that is something that happened as well. That there were certain ways in which they decided to preserve the story in a way that was not easy because none of it's easy, but that was protective in some way of both themselves and of their children uh, to the degree possible. I hate to end this discussion. It's wonderful to get a chance to hear you talk about your book and to hear you read your grandfather's words, especially, but I have made a promise that I will draw to a close. And so I must, um, first of all, Sarah, I want to thank you so much on my own behalf and on behalf of this audience and on behalf of Voices of Hope for being here tonight, for sharing so much of yourself and of this story with us. It's been a real treat, I think, for all of us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so appreciative. Of course, I'm like quickly checking myself, looking back at the book <laughs> to make sure I was like trying to remember who was lobbying against the Jewish refugees. Um, Everybody. And making sure I didn't, but you have to read the book so that you can um, you can find out all the pieces about my grandfather. And actually, really, really, really reading about Vali, I think, is the most um, essential piece of this, which is just that she she's a remarkable woman, and I felt very privileged to have gotten a chance to know her. Um, Sherry, this has also been a huge privilege to get to talk to you. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, um, and um, you. I'm glad that I had a small chance to see your grandmother on video, although I'm very, very sad that I didn't have a chance to meet her. And so, I hope you know, may her memory be for a blessing. And I'm sorry I didn't know her. Sorry, no, I'll cry. I, sorry. No, I, <laughs> I promise there's at least five other people on, <laughs> on here tonight crying too. No, I, I appreciate it. She would have she would have loved um, to hear you tonight. She certainly would have. I want to thank also Voices of Hope for having us tonight. And I know um, Kathy will put in the chat ways to buy paper love. So if you haven't read it,
You really must. It's incredible. And I will say for all of you, you know, second and third generation in the audience tonight, I think one of also the pleasures of this book that Sarah probably wouldn't admit to or doesn't experience herself is reading about her experience of figuring out this story of, of the coming and going of putting the pieces together. It's absolutely incredible. And it's really interesting as someone who um, feels a, a kinship in that relationship to history to read how she does this. Um, if you're interested also in donating to Voices to Hope and Voices of Hope in supporting this kind of important work, um, you can make a donation at ctvoicesofhope.org or use their text to give number or even find them on Venmo. Um, all of those ways of giving are listed in the chat box. Um, I encourage you to keep coming to Voices of Hope events and up next on July 28th at 7 p.m. is the Family Artifacts Show and Tell. You can visit ctvoicesofhope.org for more details on the program and for a full listing of their upcoming fall programs. I also want to let you know that when you close Zoom tonight, you may see a poll pop up. Um, Voices would love your feedback and so if you have a moment to answer that poll, they'll be grateful to hear from you. Uh, so, you know, yep, there it is. There it is. Sarah, thank you. Thank you again for coming tonight and for speaking with all of us. Uh, Robin, Kathy, other Sarah, thanks again. Everyone, thank you for being here. It was my pleasure. Thank Have you again night. so much. I hope um, and I'm happy to, you know, you can reach out to me. You can find me on my, on my website and otherwise. But thanks again, Sherry. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, other Sarah. Um, thanks all of you for, for listening and, um, and for caring about the story and for